Hi, my name's Paul Grogan and welcome to episode 38 of the Gaming Rules Podcast, where I only talk about the games that I've been playing and various other things that I've been up to. Joining me as a co-host and special guest on this episode is UK games designer David Mortimer. Thanks to everyone who contributed to the discussions on the BGG Guild and threw in some questions for David. And remember, if you want to start your own conversations on the Guild, you can. There's no need to wait for me to, to start one. And the competition from last time is still open. I'll be sending all of the show names to Gil soon for him to choose his favourite, and I'll announce the winner on Podcast 39. So if you haven't seen the competition from Podcast 38 or listened to the competition, um, you could win a copy of the Networks. So yeah, go ahead, listen to that podcast and send in your entries soon. Thanks as always to the sponsors of the show, Games Law, the UK's largest specialist games retailer at gameslaw.com. Gaming Rules News. Well, I've finished my editing job on a couple of other rule books recently, and one of them is for a new game which launched on Kickstarter a few days ago. This is Crisis from Ludi Creations. Um, it's unlike most of their other game titles. It's quite heavier. Uh, it's more of a Euro-style game. It's got worker placement, uh, resource management, the usual stuff, but it is a little bit different. You're running companies to produce resources, but the game is set in this country of Axia, which is part of an economic union, and it's in financial crisis, and basically during the game you have options. Whenever you produce goods, you can sell them on the black market to, to get lots of money, um, or you can actually sell them overseas, which, which does the country good. And there is this mechanism within the game where every round there is a goal set and the player's victory points or the player's current victory points are compared to that goal and if a player has less than the current goal then the country will suffer and that affects how the game is actually played anyway it's a pretty solid game it does a few things uh, quite interesting so if you are interested in the game check out the kickstarter campaign i wasn't personally involved in the game myself only as editor of the rulebook I've also started work on the videos that I'm doing for Gloomhaven, which is a huge undertaking. I'm still at the script writing stage, which for such an epic game, uh, it's it's impossible to cover everything. But I've, I've tried to do the best I can, decide what to talk about, what to miss out, making sure I don't flood any viewers with too much information, but also give them enough so that they can learn how to play the game. I've also been sent all of the print files for this game because I'm gonna have to do some of it digitally. And I'm super excited about it. I, mean, I was excited about this game before, but trying to resist reading through too much of the stuff because of spoilers. I mean, this game is just uh, epic on, on, a, on a massive scale. I've also been working on the rules video for Codenames Pictures, which I need to have done before Gen Con, which is not actually too far away. Um, but before that, I'm going to be attending Manacon less, uh, next weekend in Leicester. Manacon's one of those gaming cons in the UK that's been running for over 30 years now. And if people were listening to this podcast this time last year, they've probably heard me talk about it then. Now, Manacon, I remember going to Manacon in the early 90s when pretty much all we had was things like Axes and Allies, Diplomacy, Early Games Workshop games and so on. Then, obviously, I stopped going for a number of years as I got into other things, but I've been going back to Manacon recently. Now, Manacon for me is going to be primarily work, but that's okay. I'm going to be demoing various new CGE games uh, and some old ones if people want to know them. A new game from Watch Your Game, going to be demoing Crisis, Time Stories, and I'm going to be coming, uh, running a couple of tournaments. Suffice it to say that it's highly likely I probably won't play a single game myself over the four days that I'll be there, but that's okay because I love demoing. If you are listening to this podcast and you're going to be attending Manicon, then please do say hello. Special guest. So I'm happy to welcome to the show fellow Brit, David J. Mortimer, who has had a number of his games published in the last few years. So welcome to the show, David. Thanks for having me on, Paul. Um, so first of all, just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, which is also answering the first question we've had in from the Guild, from Christian, which is, what do you do for your day job? Well, actually, I'm, I'm working as a supply chain analyst at the moment, um, qualified accountant, but um, have moved across and um, looking at things like for the purchasing, procurement side of it, um, the delivery, uh, warehousing, pulling up analytics, using a tool called Tableau to um, turn all that data and information into something people can understand. Okay, so apart from job-wise, family life and stuff like that, I mean, you live in in, in, in England, whereabouts do you live? Um, middle of Wiltshire, Melksham, a small town. Um, I've got uh, uh, a wife called Rachel and uh, two boys, Jacob and Adam. 
Cool, and they help you uh, develop games, I, uh, I believe. Yeah, they're, they're my alpha testers. They don't, <laughs> they don't mind when it crashes and burns. Um, so, uh, yeah, they, they, they do a lot of testing for me. Yeah, so speaking of the games, so how many games is it you've had published? Um, five. Five, right. So, just so that all of these budding games designers out there, because there's a lot of them, and I just want them to get an idea of how it works, it isn't that you've designed five games, they've all been picked up, and they've all been published. How many games have you designed that crashed and burned or were finished in your eyes but then didn't get picked up? I mean, I, if only every game I designed was published, Paul, it would be brilliant. Yeah. Um, I've designed round about, about 30 games now. Right. Um, and I would say roughly half of those don't reach a stage where I'd be happy to put it in front of a publisher. Okay. Um, they, you know, they work, they, they play, but they, they don't sort of reach that level where I'd be, you know, happy to... To, to, to be out pitching it um, yeah. then of the remainder um, probably about another half again actually make it through so okay. so whilst I've had five published I've got three sat with yes. the publishers right now you know sort of in the final stages of looking to sign up contracts and such like okay so one so so half of the games that you thought were finished and good enough to put in front of a publisher no publisher has actually been interested in them. Is there any one of those, for example, that you think, this is an amazing game, if only somebody would actually pick it up, or do you think they're all like that? No, I mean, there's... the designed for different sort of um, markets and such like, so sometimes it's a matter of finding the right partner rather than yeah. the game isn't isn't what they're after. I mean, there's, there's one, the, a micro war game, that, that is set against the Wars of the Roses I've been working on for a while. Um, mm -hmm was struggling to because it's a two player micro game at one point those weren't fashionable or there's a few more of them about now yeah um, and it's trying to find the right fit so that that one hopefully is uh, will be coming out um, in the future it's it's with a publisher right now um, who's, oh, okay who's quite keen on it so uh, excellent so yeah I think I think because because gaming has just taken an exponential rise I know a lot of people that think right if he can do it I can do it and somebody like yourself, who's got a full-time job and a family life and everything else, and you've had these published games, I think there's a lot of people that go, right, I'm going to go and design a game, and it will be picked up, and it will be published, and it, it's, it's just not like that. No, no, but it's... You, I mean, obviously, you, you get payback on effort, and um, whilst you need a bit of luck, because you speak to anyone about them getting mm -hmm. their first game published, they, there's been a bit of luck somewhere. They've, they've made that luck happen sometimes as well. Yeah. And a lot of it is networking. It's, it's yeah. finding out how the industry works, um, ingratiating yourself with the publishers, maybe working with them um, at shows, um, those kind of things. Meeting them, finding out what you know what they're after, what they're looking out for, and then when, you, when you've got something that you think is appropriate, you, you can put it in front of them. Yeah. I mean, if anybody listening, who, you know, he is in the position of they are a budding games designer and ever wants uh, any advice from me how to break into it, or, or even yourself, if you're happy to answer things like that. As you say, networking, getting to know these people. You can't just turn up at an event and go, hi, you've never heard of me and I don't really know the rest of your games, but here's a game idea, will you publish it? It's like, no, you've, you've kind of got to, as you say, you've got to get in there and, and network a bit first. Yeah, exactly. And there's other things like um, entering competitions, sort of international mm -hmm. competitions, that, that will certainly help raise the profile of your game if, if, if you win that. Um, if you... But meetup groups are brilliant. I mean, I, I joined Playtest UK uh, back in early 2012 um, with the view that I wanted to get a game published. Um, right. The game I took along with me um, is one that's on the shelf, still not not been picked up. Um, and but there I met people. Um, I met a lot of British designers um, who sort of you know give you advice, tell you their stories of how they got published, and um, and you find your way. But ultimately, you got to get yourself in front of the the publishers, and yeah. there's only one place in Europe to really do that, and that's that's Essen. Well, UK Games Expo as well. It, it's growing now. I mean, the yeah. last last few years, I. I didn't didn't do any pitching there, but um, this year, I mean, it's a different story. I, I met some publishers there, and there's you know there's more and more international publishers coming now. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I I was at Expo working for CG, and I had five people come up and pitch games to me. Okay, cool. So some of them had uh, had arranged it beforehand, and had even sent me all of the stuff, and I, I met with them and sat them, and some of them just approached me 
on the day and said we're interested in you know having you publish publish our game kind of thing from the sound of it it's going to grow again and i can only see that getting bigger i mean the the, the big german publishers are starting to have a, a bigger presence now yeah and um some of the american publishers coming over which is yeah great. yeah yeah so anyway let's let's go back to your games first one that you had published right well officially published through uh through an international publisher was dragon slayer that was right. the first one that actually came out and you could buy in the stores uh push your luck dice game um, you're hunting down dragons, um, uh, trying to slay them before they turn you to toast, basically. Hence the name of the game. Hence the name of the game. So when did that come out? Um, that that came out in it was a Kickstarter in 2014. Okay. Um, I'd met with um, Travis of Indie Boards and Cards at Essen in 2013, although I'd been in contact with him for uh, probably six months before that um, with the sort of game idea and development and such like. Right. But um, yeah, I mean the the that that one came about initially i was um i had an idea for a game with dragons on the dice which had been inspired by uh, looking at some icons on a, a, a resource site that i use called gameicons.net oh right okay um <laughs> which is and and on there there was a dragon's head a bat's wing and a scorpion tail and right. um, they were next to each other and i thought well that looks cool um maybe if i put those onto a dice along with a sword um, a shield and, and a dragon flame, um, then uh, there'd, there'd be a way of, of, of creating a game from that. Okay, um, so you were inspired to create the game by simply looking at a website called gameicons.net. I think Net, it's game, and game. you saw some icons. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, no, and it and it just you know and 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 it was a very different game to what it what it ended up. Yeah, Back then yeah. it was a shield manipulation game. Really, you were just trying to manage your resources through the dice. But then I was at Playtest UK, like I said, I was doing some networking, and a couple of guys I was chatting to there were talking about how they'd, you know, Travis had asked for submissions for a Push It Up Dice game. Yeah. They'd had theirs, you know, um, rejected with, along with reasons why, and having spoken to them all, I started to understand, you know, what he was looking for. Okay. Um, I tailored my game before I submitted it, and then uh, submitted it to him, because uh, he, he certainly used to take um, submissions direct um, through his website. Yep. And um and he liked the idea and um but there was still some development to do and then like I say over that six months um developed it through, met at Essen. Um that's when the twist got added, which was the challenge tokens. Um, right. we came up with the idea there. Um and then uh, yeah, then came out the following year. Yeah, and there's that's another key thing. So people who've listened to various other of my podcasts in the past when I've when I've interviewed designers, they've mentioned tailoring a game to the to the mm-hmm. publisher that you're going to go with and if that publisher has specifically given reasons for je- rejecting other people's similar games then you did exactly the right thing it's like it's like when you tailor your cv to the job yes yeah, yeah. you know you, you kind of you kind of got to do that and i i with in my role with cg i always you know have a bit more respect for people who come up and say i know the kind of games that you do and i've designed one which i think will fit in because it's got this this and this and you can tell that they've they've done their homework and they're not just pitching to you because you have a booth they actually know who you are and they've they've either set it in one of your universes or you know they've they've done some clever twists so yeah yeah, that's good no i think i think it's key you you, because they have a specific market that they're targeting um and uh that that way you've got you've got much more chance at least of getting your foot in the door to show it Um, yeah definitely but like just going back to what you were saying about expert it's always worth organizing these things in advance your chance of actually getting a meeting on spec at a show are very very small so uh you know trawl trawl their websites find their find out their contact details make contact and uh and try and get a a meeting booked in yeah right so guys game one done yeah game two Uh, when did that hot hot on the the tails of the dragon slayer was pocket imperium although it was originally um released as a print and play in 2013 yes on um brett gilbert's um uh good little games yep. site um and that was um and and again that came through me meeting brett at the playtest uk um he was saying he was looking games for the launch of that site um i'd had an idea for having i played a lot of twilight imperium right um <laughs> and but not enough that i could carry on doing that with the family life the way that was that was changing and um so decided to just try and make something smaller so perhaps with my younger boys i could i could play play something they they could play yeah um, and how did that go on about getting picked up by Luda creations then well it, it, he actually saw it on the good little game site right um and uh contacted me actually just he it, he contacted me and then we met at the same essen 
that, that I met with Travis for yep. Dragon Slayer. Um, in fact, they were the only two publishers I met that year because that year I went to go and meet people for the first time just to make contact, to start right. getting the contacts for the following years. Um, and, and again, he, he, was, he was keen. He had some ideas how he wanted to sort of evolve it because originally it was just 18 cards um, and it was just a three-player game. So yep. obviously we had to expand that to be two to four. Um, and then the sort of hex hex style tiles that we use within that game. So that's the other way to get your game picked up. Yeah, well, uh. <laughs> it, it is another way. Yeah, I mean, and and that site certainly that had a few successes because that's where Empire Engines by yeah. uh, Matthew Dunson. Yeah. I mean, Chris Brett's Harman. still running that site, isn't he? It, it is, and so you can I, still. I will put details of that site in the show notes. I know Brett doesn't; he's not a big podcast listener, um, so he's probably not going to listen to the show. But I, I will mention to him that we've we've plugged his website. Yes, because there, there's a few. I mean, even Bad Grammars by Tony Boyle. You know, yeah. there's there's a, there's a lot of games on there that. Um, that did get picked up, and there's yeah. there's some good ones that haven't been, if you see what I mean. So, yes, yeah, right. Game three. Uh, game three was microfilms, which um, originally started out as uh, a, a sort of I'd played Redacted, but it wasn't intended to be a spin-off of Redacted. But I really right. liked the way the three-player rules um, were set up in Redacted, where you had two sides, and you didn't know who the two who were together. Um, would be facing one opponent, um, right. and and so the redacted itself. You were you were trying to find out who was on your side. Then you'd have to get their um, information, get it to the helicopter, and, and and get out. And I I I liked the way that just the three player mechanic actually was set up and worked. So that gave you the inspiration to create this game. Well, yeah. Although that was actually I was doing a Wars of the Roses sort of marriages and betrayal game at that time. So that's right. that's where that started. Um, and it was just again an eighteen card game. Um, nothing more than that at that point, but I knew I'd met David David Turtsy, one of, one of the redacted designers at Playtest. So I decided to sort of show it to him, just to say, look, you know, I like that element. Um, I thought it would make a good game, and he played it and he enjoyed it. But he said, you know, he came back a bit late and said, well, if we added this, this, and this, and, and <laughs> took it in this direction, we could actually make this, you know, like a, a mini version of Redacted. And um, and so that's that's how we ended up um, doing that one. Which is why he's he's a co-designer. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah, and 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 a lot of the stuff that was added afterwards came from Dave. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, th- th- and that was interesting because that was my first co-design. So right. uh, that was uh, interesting. And there's there's lots of different ways to do co-design, but then that's another way as well. I mean, if you if you're working with someone, um, you can you can push a game forward much faster. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna throw in one question from the guild here. This is from Rob Harper, and this is following on from. Um, microfilms that you've mentioned is is it confusing with there being so many Davids in the UK game des- design scene uh, it, it does seem a little bit bonkers <laughs> I must admit I mean even at Playtest UK in London it's usually about 25% to maybe a third of, of the people there are called David wow uh, okay I mean, we've, we've reached we've started calling ourselves Daves of Wonder um, <laughs> and, and brilliant we've, 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 we've even got you know t-shirts and everything now um, oh right you know, excellent is, there's a movement happening here and I'm you know, we're determined one day we will design a game all together and publish it as Days of Wonder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or, or well, we probably won't get away with that one, but you know, along along those lines, and um, have you know all the designer names on there. Have, have right, <laughs> all called David. Excellent. Right. So games four and five then came out fairly close together, and both from AEG. Yes. Yes. So that that was um, I, I was pitching back in 2014 um, at Essen. Um, I'd had an introduction to AEG, I'd met the team there, they're, they're great guys, um, and had the opportunity to show them three or four games. Um, Flock was one of those. And it, it, Flock was proving quite quite popular amongst the publishers as I was showing it. Again, it was I was pitching it more as a micro game. Right. Um, people might not realise, this, this, this was inspired by um, Dominant Species. Okay. That, that's where I started with that, a worker placement area control game. Um, but the only pun on that I could come up with was um, prominent feces, which would have taken the game <laughs> in a whole different direction. Yeah, that would have been a different game entirely. <laughs> yeah, so um, so, uh, but I was it was it was inspired by that. But I was also working or trying to work on a co-design with uh, Robin Lees, who's mm-hmm. um, Beyond Baker Street um, and obviously podcast podcaster himself. Um, a game called um, World War Moo we were working on. Um, okay. Which again was another spin off of another design that I haven't had, had done, um, where we were sending cows into war. But we just we just couldn't quite get it to work how we wanted. So um and this mechanic of 
displacing lots of workers and then triggering it so everybody else has to take it at the same time was was one I'd suggested for that that we decided wouldn't work. Right. Um, so I took that away and then uh, one day saw a out walking the dog and then a, a bird flew away and then the whole flock flew and I thought ah you know there's there's the uh, theme that, that right. fits my mechanic and um, and so evolved it from there. Okay. Um, but um, a lot of people tend to look at that game and think that it's a very simple resource management game, but you know the, the crux of that game isn't isn't the resource management. It's it's the uh, the timing and the undercutting of your opponent so that you're triggering triggering those cards when they benefit you most rather than uh, when they benefit your opponents. Right. And um, so it needed to be a simple worker placement. So you, so you could. If you had many paths to victory in that game, um, people wouldn't know when to trigger it. Um, so uh, I deliberately kept that simple. Okay. And then finally, a game yeah. that I've been talking about quite a bit in the last few weeks, Twilight Squabble. Yeah. Yeah. Now, obviously, I, I am a fan of Twilight Struggle. I mean, I don't think... I've, I've not made any secret of that. Um, my son my son was studying um, history, uh, was doing about the Cold War, and he asked to play it. Um, this was obviously a couple of years ago. Um, and it was... It, we muddled our way through it, but it was just too big and too long. It for, is, yeah, for, for him to to fully grasp at that time. Um, he beats me at it now, um, but uh, so I decided to make something smaller just so he could remember the events. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, did some uh, come up with the uh, balance of power track and um, you know using the agents and uh, again it's, it's it's a bluffing. Um, push your luck in, in some respects because you're trying to pull, pull the uh, the balance of power in your okay. favour. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have classed it as push your luck, but I can see I can see why. Yeah, you thought about yeah. Yeah, I mean so. these the sort of influence that came through there, but um, yeah. So uh, and, that, and that again was AG pitched at yeah. the same at the same meeting, and that, that did come out in a in, in a good size box because I have to say Flock yeah. was was way too big a box for what you got in it. Twilight Squabble, perfect. Nice yeah. li little box. Everything's in there. Pocket it's just, sized. it's just great. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I Lewis Holt wants to know of, of the games that you've done. What came first, the pun or the game? Um, in each occasion, it was the uh, the game. Yeah, the game. and it sounds oh. like you've done, um, you know, a a smaller, lighter version of Twilight Struggle, a smaller, lighter version of Twilight Imperium. And you started with a smaller, lighter version of Dominant Species. Yeah. I, know, they, 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 I mean, and it's not because I've deliberately sat down and said, I want to do a smaller, lighter version of that. It's um, either been um, because there's a mechanic in there I really like that I felt I could, I could condense down and make a small, pocket sized version of. Um, yeah. And also to try and, um, well, for my sons, um, because they were younger, when it's, particularly when I was doing those games. Um, yeah. The other games were too big for them. And so that kind of drove me down that route to uh, to design those. Well, it's a different market as well. You know, it there is. are people who will play Pocket Imperium who will never touch Twilight Imperium, and and same with Twilight Struggle and Twilight Squabble. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, I've introduced Twilight Squabble to I don't know about a dozen people over the last couple of weeks. Two of them have gone on to buy it. One of them hates Twilight Struggle. Uh, one of them loves Twilight Struggle, so don't don't dismiss it if you th if you don't like Twilight Struggle. Is what I think I'm trying to say. Yeah, I mean the the, the only the real overlap is obviously the theme. The you theme. Know, that's that's yes. that's where it sort of it's not it's not scratching the same same edge. It's not a three hour war game. Um, like you say, it's it's a short, fast filler uh, for two and less random, in um, my opinion. Yes, yeah, yes. Because yes. because my big downside of Twilight Struggle is love the theme, love the game mechanics, love what the game is trying to do, and then dice rolls for coup attempts, dice rolls for realignment rolls, dice rolls for... And I'm like, seriously? And, and I know the people will argue, oh, the better player will always win, but those dice results can be... You know, the difference between a one and a six is absolutely massive. But yeah. anyway, that, that's another story for another time. Mm -hmm. Question in from Stephen Robinson. What drives you to take these larger game experiences and condense them into shorter games? And I think you've sort of touched on that a bit, but is there anything you haven't said about it? Well, yeah, like I say, I mean, the real driver has been, you know, to design games my sons would want to play. Yeah. That's, that's been the real driver. Although usually it's like a, there's a mechanic within the game that, spark something in my brain that might work with something else i mean mm -hmm. there's you know there's other games that that i've played that i'd love to to do something um based off um virgin queen's one um i think the um marriages and stuff in in, in that is is a great 
great mechanic that, that could be could be used in a smaller package. Okay. But it's 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 not a conscious decision. I'm going to take that game and I'm going to make it smaller. It's just generally usually when I'm playing it or planning to play it, something will spark in the mind, join with something else with another mechanic, and um, and then the the whole process starts. Okay, yeah, because he also wants to know what's the process for deciding what to keep from these systems. But it sounds like you you play it and you go ah that bit I really like. Yeah. So so there it is. That's the bit you take. Yeah, it, it, it's not a sort of I'm not taking the game and slicing bits off until I've got what I've left. That's that's not how it works at all. It's right. it, it's something will inspire an idea um, within that game, um, and then I'll run with it and see where it goes. Very cool. And a final question in from Paul from Games Law: What games do you not play and what game would you be really tempted to redesign rather than just tweak it with house rules and i play most games i mean i'll leave you know eat, you know with the right um group of people you know mm-hmm. I'll, with my when my children were younger or with my niece and nephew i'll, I'll play you know roll a movie you know those, those kind of games that the, what i won't play or what i don't seek out to play is perfect information abstract games right okay I, that's not my cup of tea i did i did play chess as a youngster obviously yeah. okay so yeah, so what what games would you be really tempted to redesign rather than the, just one? Tweak? I'd I'd love to have have a have a go, and and it's only one aspect of the game. Um, is Martin Wallace's Struggle of Empires, yeah, and um, which is a brilliant game, and the auction mechanic in there is is phenomenal. And again, that's another mechanic I could see in another smaller game that, that right. worked brilliantly um, for a large number of players. And Struggle of Empires does take about nine hours to play. So yeah, yeah, yeah. well, yeah. well we, we we tend to play it in sort of four <laughs> or five. So. Uh, um, but um, what I would one of the things I think, and, and I think I saw something you tweet something about this with Five Five. What I don't like about a game is when you've got so many options at the beginning, and 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 in in there you've you've got um, all the tiles, all the uh, um, different tiles to pick to pick from right at the start. And I, I think I'd like to redesign that as a deck so they sort of fed in through the game type of thing. Okay. Yeah, I'll mention this in the what I've played section next, and we can talk about it a bit more there. But you're right. Yeah. A game which, you know, when you look at it straight away, you've got a hundred different options, mm. and you've got to sit there staring at the board and working out what the best one is. Yeah. Well, not necessarily. You don't have to, but then player two has probably spotted the best move, and you've got advantage because you're going first, and that's been compensated for in the game rules. And you're looking at it, and you don't spot that killer move, and then he does. Mm. And it's I yeah, uh, I like games with options, but not not when you've got to stare at a board of a million pieces and try yeah. and. Work out a little bit chess like you know you're staring at the board and you're going right I've got all these options which one which one do I want to do yeah I, I prefer my options to sort of branch out as you go through the game and, yeah uh, yeah definitely, definitely okay cool so just before you go I'm celebrating my BGG guild reaching the magic number of members 273 magic number obviously mm-hmm. um, so basically it's just any, any excuse to do another competition and you said you'd be happy to provide a copy of microfilms yes. to the winner yes certainly so the competition, uh, many ways to enter the competition. Basically, share um, share on Facebook the post that I make about this podcast when it goes live or retweet it on Twitter. That gets you one entry. And also, if you email me with the answer to the following questions, and the email address is gaming-rules at outlook.com. And the question is, in Twilight Squabble, what does the white cube represent in the game and where does it go in the game? So if you know the game, really easy. If you don't know the game, go and look it up worthwhile having a look up anyway um, you've got until sunday 24th of july to enter and i'll do the draw during the recording of the next podcast so thanks very much and good luck to everybody who enters and thanks dave for joining me on the special guest section of the show i'll see you in the next bit yeah it's been a pleasure what paul has played so last weekend i hosted summer rune meet which is an invite only three-day gaming event held at my house in devon with lots of people staying over and making a mess And I got to play lots and lots of games, so many that I'm not going to cover them all here, I'm just going to mention a few of them. If you are interested, uh, the full list of games that we played, um, the geek list is number 210714, I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, David is joining me again for this section of the show to join in with the chat, so thanks again David for joining me. That's okay. And I'm going to start off with a game which is the first game I played at RuneMeet, and I introduced it to loads and loads of people at RuneMeet, and it was massively popular and you're not going to like it, David. It's Onitama. <laughs> yeah, a perfect information. A perfect game. information game. So, not your cup of tea at all. Have you tried it? I, I've not tried it. I did. Look, I did take a look at it, and um, 
I must say the the card mechanic seems quite interesting. It is. Yeah. And although it's perfect information, I would definitely recommend just trying it because it is like 15, 20 minutes, something like that. Um, it's, re it's, it's really, really easy to teach and it just plays really well. So chess fans and non-chess fans were really enjoying it. Um, and yeah, it's just a great game. I did mention it on the last podcast, so I won't bang on about it too much here, but that's, uh, that's Onit Armour and I believe you can't buy it at the moment because it's so good it's sold out. But... I believe they'll be doing another version, and that's from Arcane Wonders. Next game I wanted to mention, uh, it's been getting quite a bit of attention on social media because it's just come out, and this um, mainly, I think, because it's got a cute pig on the front cover. Um, always good for a game. Eh? Always good for a game. <laughs> no sheep in this one, just pigs. So this is Via Nebula, and it's designed by Martin Wallace and published by Space Cowboys. Now, I've worked on the rulebook for this game, so I haven't actually played the game. They sent me the rulebook, and my job was to read through it, Make sure I understand how to play from reading the rulebook, uh, and then obviously edit it and make any corrections. So I did quite a bit of work on that, but the game has just come out, and a number of people at Rune Meet did play it. Now, I didn't. I didn't get a chance to play it. So what I've done is I've asked all of my friends who did play it to give me their opinion of the game. So first of all, Tom Westrope said it's good. Thanks for that, Tom. Uh, Sally said it's pretty. You can see how these, uh, these reviews are going to go. Um, but Ben Martin says that he played it four times, so he must have liked it enough to play it a number of times. He liked the joint exploration and exploitation mechanic, but he's got mixed feelings about the game. He said some of the cards were well-themed, blowing fog around, for instance, but he found the name very misleading. A number of people thought it was called Via Nebula, so he's like, oh, do you want to play Via Nebula? And straight away, people think it's a space game. And of course it's not. It's got like monsters in the fog and pigs and, and things like that. So I think Ben found that the overall theme of the game was fairly, fairly bland. And it could have been, it could have easily been rethemed into, into anything else. But he did say that the pig meeple was the most attractive part of the game. Uh, Matt Prowse said it was bright and colourful and he'd play it as a pickup game. But overall, he was disappointed. Um, he left it feeling a bit meh which is a, a common word used these days to describe a lot of games. You can't please everybody, though, can you? No, exactly. Now, Mark, a good friend of mine, uh, he played three games. He enjoyed them all. So it's kind of good that I've got you know, different opinions on the game. Mark said that he likes the game because it was tight and the scores were close and nobody was getting hammered, but he felt that the better player did win in each of the games, so presumably he did. Um, he liked the fact that there's interesting layers that you discover after a couple of plays, and he played it three times, so... Presumably he did discover new things about the game. And he liked the way that you have to plan the use of your two men. You get two men in a four-player version. Um, so that you know you time when they become available to you. He likes the speed of the game. I think when I first went up after I knew they were playing it, I went upstairs to the room upstairs where they were playing it. They'd been at it about 90 minutes. And they said, yeah, we're just finishing our second game. Mm -hmm. And that was with learning the rules. None of them knew how to play it. They got the game, opened the rule book. Uh, and learn how to play and play two games within 90 minutes um, and it is, the, the production quality of the game is really good um, not just the pigs but you know everything else in the game well that's that's a signature Space Cowboy isn't it I yes mean, they, yeah, they, they do, do good quality over stuff. the top on quality sometimes but, so um, I don't know if you've had a chance to try this one yet but it looks like a fairly you know lightish game playable in about 40-45 minutes with cute pigs in it yeah I mean it, it's on my list to, to take a look at I mean I love Martin Wallace's stuff anyway yeah. and um, if there's one that can be played inside an hour but still still challenge you um, that sounds right up my street to be honest so. yeah I mean I, I've i worked on the rule book for that game and also his new zombie one Hit Z Road mm -hmm. and I've got more respect for Martin as a designer I mean I've always thought he's a great designer and he's done some absolutely amazing games I think he's done a couple of duff games in my opinion um but after working on the just the rule book for those two games, the, you know I realised he's got more. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? He's done a number of very very different design games. He's not like you know always focused on one particular type of game. Versatile, that's the word Vers I'm looking yeah, for. Um, and Vlager for me is the most versatile designer, and that's my that was my personal opinion before he became my boss. Mm -hmm. um, but Martin Wallace, I think, has definitely shown that he is very versatile. You know, from from things like Hit Zero, Push Your Luck, Zombie Game, to Via Nebula, 45-minute Light Euro, right up to you know, Princes of the Renaissance. <laughs> yeah. You know, all, all the, you know, and 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 let's not forget, you know, Age of Steam. Yeah. 
things no, like no, that. And, he, and I think obviously with his when he was doing his tree frog line, he, he was trying to hit a certain audience. So he obviously got you know a reputation for that type of game, which yeah. you know, and a lot of which were excellent games. Um, but he's with his opportunity now to pitch through other publishers. Um, I think we'll see a lot of different stuff. Yeah. And since this podcast is being recorded on the 10th of July, happy birthday, Martin. He's yeah, not listening, birthday, and he probably won't listen, but it is his birthday. So <laughs> happy uh, happy 27th birthday to, uh, to to Martin. Everybody's 27 in my book. So tell us about one of the games that you've been playing recently. Um, well, um, one, one that, that I've played a couple of times recently is uh, Guilds of London. Um, mm-hmm. Tony this will keep Tony happy. Oh, yes, yes. Um, but... Uh, and. Um, um, I've played it with the family and I've played it with my uh, friends from work and n- neither of which are heavy gamer groups. Um, okay. I've, I've yet to try it with a heavy gamer group. Um, and, 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 and both enjoyed it and it, it'll certainly be hitting the table again. Um, okay. Certainly from my experience from playing it twice, the, the first game is that, that bit longer with... Um, uh, Tony won't like me saying this, but trying to understand the icons. Well, he's um, learning the icons. It yes. is, it is. But once you've learned them, the game, the game speeds up tremendously. Yeah. But um, what you're saying is that you've played this game with your family and non-gaming work colleagues and the icons were not a hindrance to them being able to play the game. It, I mean, it, it took us two and a half, three hours to play. So, right. Um, but the actual game itself, because it's, you know, and, and when I say non-gaming, they're non-heavy gamers. They, okay. They, they do play, you know, we've played El Grande and oh, um, right, okay. know, th- those kind of games. Yeah. Um, and uh, so this was one I wanted to try with them um, and, and, and they certainly enjoyed it, definitely. It, it, with them, it was a three-player game with the work with the work guys, and um, we we had no problem with the neutral liveryman. We were loving it, and um, you know they they seem a key part to the game to me. I know, I know right. some people prefer not not to do it that way. Um, listening to yep. your last podcast, for example, yep. um, but um, you know it's it was a cutthroat time, you know that, that he's trying to replicate there, and uh, and and you know area control games they all have a nasty little edge to yes. them. And uh, and I don't th- personally, I don't think it'd be quite the same game without without using it the way it's been designed. Yeah, but it's nice that um, Gil's done that because yes. it, it 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 keeps most of the game. It just tweaks that little bit. Yeah, and and, and house ruling is you know you've bought the game, you can do what you want with it. Yeah. At the end of the day, um, and 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 you if you if you're going to get more plays out of it by tweaking it to fit your group, then all well and good. Um, but uh, it's, it's the people who house rule games and then and then criticise the games because they don't work. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, that's Guilds of London getting another mention on the Gaming Rules podcast. So that's another tenor that Tony owes me. <laughs> so uh, anyway, onto the game that I mentioned in the other section, which was Five Tribes. Now I've not played Five Tribes before last weekend. I'm not saying I deliberately avoided playing it, but you know there are so many games coming out these days. You don't get a chance to play all of them. But Five Tribes is one of those games that I am aware that lots of people have played it, lots of people really, really like it. Days of Wonder knock out very good games, and they only do the one a year, but they knock out some really good games. So Five Tribes got offered on the table. I currently didn't have anything to do at that moment in time, so I went, tell you what, yeah, let's jump in, because I need to play it in order to have my own opinion about it. I wasn't expecting to dislike it as much as I did, but that's not because the game's bad before anybody starts you know, sending me, uh, sending me emails. Everybody else who played the game liked the game. It's just not for me. I have, you know, there was nothing wrong with the game. The game worked, the game mechanics worked, the point system, the scoring mechanism, that all was fine. But when you set up the board and you lay all of those meeples all over the board, and then you go, right, you're going first, and you have to stare at the board and look for that, the best move, and yeah, like I mentioned in the earlier session, you don't have to spend that time looking for the best move. You could take the second best move. But then if, if the other player, if there, is, if, the, if there is like this awesome move on the table and you miss it and the other player spots it, then the advantage of you going first is, is negated kind of thing. I, I suppose that gives um, experienced players more advantage. Um, well, it's... except I won. <laughs> so yeah, I, I won. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was pretty sure I was last. And I was just not randomly doing stuff, but I was just doing stuff. Um, whereas the other two players were actually, they had a plan, they had a strategy, they were doing, and they seemed to be doing lots more stuff than me. They were getting the, the viziers, is it, or the gods? Mm-hmm. They yeah. were getting them, and they were doing some crazy powers, and they were getting all of this. And I was just sort of fumbling a bit around in the dark and doing random bits here and there, not really with any kind of direction. And I won. So I'm like, 
oh, okay, um, yeah. But I'm glad I've played it because I've now played it. I've got my own opinion of the game, and that's it. You know, it, it, it's it's ticked off the list. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, back to other games played at Rune Meet. Uh, Saturday, four, four of us sat down to play the full five scenario campaign of Warhammer Quest Adventure Card Game. I played the first two scenarios, then I dropped out to run a group of people through Time Stories, but Tony stepped in and they actually finished the campaign. So that was good. I did want to play the whole campaign, but then when a group of Time Stories people wanted to start up, I thought, no, I'll, I'll help them uh, join in that one. So uh, I, I've only played the first two scenarios of that myself, um, but I do want to finish it off at some point. I don't know if you've seen that one or if it's your kind of thing. I, I've seen it on the... Did you ever play the original Warhammer Quest? No. Okay, because oh, no, I played that back when it, when it first came yeah, out. Mo yeah, most people, most people have. Yeah. Um, and most people have very, very fond memories of it, although I think it's it falls to me in the same category of the old classic games that would never play again. Yeah, you're probably, you're probably right. Um, but it, it was probably one of those first sort of legacy type games where you, you know, you you're developing your character through the various games, yeah, um, but in a different way, in a more sort of role-playing style game. But obviously, yeah, not, yeah. Not I mean, I was an advanced game. Hero Quest per well, Hero Quest, and then advanced Hero Quest when I was younger, mm -hmm. and then I remember Warhammer Quest coming out. But I think I'd moved on to other things at that point. But it certainly got, you know, the brand Warhammer Quest has certainly got very fond memories for a, for a lot of people. Um, but the the adventure card game is one which. Most people who know me and my gaming taste are like, well, Paul's going to hate this game. It's draw a random card from the deck, random monsters, random this. It's got dice rolling in it. Why does he like it so much? Um, but I, I, I do. Um, I've accepted the, the dice and the randomness in it. But for me, it's a cooperative game that isn't just four people with the same goal. It's the way that the characters interact together. And I might have said this on a previous podcast, so I'm probably repeating myself, but... Um, yeah, and it's the way, it, you know, I like puzzle games. Mm -hmm. And I like the way that in this in this game, it's like, right, it's my turn. So, David, what are you going to do? Well, we really could do with exploring this turn, but your explore skill is exhausted. Right, i tell you what, well, I'll do this skill, I'll do this thing, which allows you to ready your skill, but it also heals us both for a wound. Oh, yeah, that'll be good. And literally the characters, they don't just work together, they actually interact with each other. And the way that the, the skills, the abilities that you use... It's it's working them together as a group, and that's that's what I really like about it. So it sounds like it's got some of the feel of the original game, then, even though it's yeah. you know just card game. Yeah, I mean it's got the, it's got scenarios, and if you play the full five scenarios, your character progresses and levels up and gets better items and all things like uh, all things like that. Okay. So uh, what else have I got played? A uh, couple of games of Battle Law Second Edition, another game with uh, with with massive amounts of dice rolling, but um, I've spent the last. Well, since last Gen Con, so I think it's what, eight, nine, ten months, painting all of the miniatures, uh, and I finally finally finished them. I hope you find time to do that, Paul, on top of everything Well, else. So, so the story behind this is, um, yeah, since I, since I gave up work and started doing gaming rules full-time, uh, I ended up taking it to the extreme. So when, when you set up your own business and start working for yourself, there are a number of pitfalls big big traps in the ground that a lot of people walk into and I, I was aware of these before I did before I made the shift and then fell right into them um, and so you went in them, with your eyes wide open absolutely and I'm down at the bottom of the pit going well they told me it'd be like this um, now how do I get out so what it is is that I, I basically I'm always working because I work from home from the moment I wake up in the morning I've got emails I've got Skype messages I'm on I'm, my brain's engaged and I'm in work mode and then because I've been taking on more and more work, mainly be just to try and you know, earn a living out of it, you know, you get the job in and you say yes. And I've not been given time for myself. So what was happening between sort of 12 months and, and two years ago is I was working pretty much every, every morning, afternoon and evening. So I was maybe having one or two evenings off a week. One of them was a games night. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was, I don't know, doing some housework or something like that. And that's not good. It's not healthy and it's not good. But I couldn't get my brain out of work mode because I'm like, right, it's six o'clock. Vicky's coming home. I've got to go and do dinner. But oh, I've got the Conan video to finish. And I'll tell you what, if I just work tonight, I'll be able to get a bit more of it done. 
And basically that happened every night and every weekend and everything else. Coupled with the fact that there's loads and loads of things on TV that we both want to watch, you know, all of these cool TV series that everybody's talking about and says are great, mm -hmm. and I don't get a chance to watch any of them because I'm always working, what I did is picked up a copy of Battle Law 2nd Edition at Gen Con last year and I went, right, this is therapy. I'm not going to like this game because it's massively random with lots of dice rolling, but I am going to sit down and I am going to paint all of these miniatures and I'm going to take ages over it. I'm not going to do like slapdash 10 minute jobs. I'm going to spend hours on every mini painting them all as a way of forcing myself to have a break from, from doing work stuff and catch up on TV because I can't just watch a TV program. I've always got to be doing something else at the same time. And although do I miss some of the visuals sometimes, I, I still manage to effectively watch the entire program and pretty much know what's going on. So that that's the backstory as to why I sort that's of started idea. doing it. Yeah. And that's how I find the time for it. it. For me, that's my downtime and my, my therapy. Now, as soon as, as soon as we've switched off the episode of Daredevil and I've finished painting, it's 10 o'clock at night, I'm back on the computer for an hour. Mm -hmm. um, because I can't, you know, the computer's on, I go to it, I see all the emails, or oh, I can't just not, because otherwise it's on my mind. But it, it's, it's been really good. And as I say, I've watched all of, uh, all of Daredevil, we're up to date with Walking Dead, all of these TV series that I wanted to watch anyway, I've now I've now managed to watch. So um, and, and, and painting's using that other part of your brain as well, Paul. So that's yeah. a good way to relax. It, oh Absolutely. yeah, I mean it, it's relaxing because my brain is is focused on the painting and the TV episode, and that and that's it. And uh, one of my personality traits is I like to do things which produce an end result. And now when I look at all my ninety-two painted battle law minis, I'm like proud of them. Yeah. So, um, you, know, you know, and playing the game, I got to play it a couple of times, and it was really nice to play the game with Tom. Um, even though, as I say, it's very random and there's lots of dice in it, it's the fact that I was playing a game that, with all of these painted minis that looks great that I spent eight months or ten months painting. So that was, uh, that was quite nice. So you'll have to look for a new project now, then, will you? Well, I'm going to Gen Con next month, <laughs> and there are expansions for Battle Law. Oh, there you go. So... <laughs> Yes. So uh, anyway, on the Sunday I got various games in uh, Twilight Squabble, uh, Roll for the Galaxy, Through the Ages, Elysium, and a new one that I got uh, from Queen Games at Origins, London Markets. Now, when when I picked this up, it's it's a redone version of a game that came out, I don't know, about 15 years ago called De Junker, I think. De Junk, something like that. I remember being at the Essen where it came out. <laughs> And we all played it, and we quite liked it, and one of my friends bought it. Um, so when they said, oh, yeah, London Markets, do you, do you want a copy of this? You know, they'll swap it for a CGE game, I think. So I was like, yeah, yeah okay, whatever. Anyway, we all got two-thirds of the way through, and everybody wanted to stop playing. So that was really odd. Um, it was just... Obviously didn't agree with you guys. It didn't agree with us. Um, there's, you know, I'll, I'll go into more detail on my on the geek list about it, if, if I can be bothered or if anybody's interested. But by a third of the way through, we were all starting thinking, oh, all right, is this, is, is this it? And then at two thirds of the way through, I said, look guys, there are better games that we could play. Does anybody actually want to finish this? And everybody went, no. Hmm. So nobody wanted to, to play it again. I don't know, there's, there's something about it. Um, and we felt that the balance was a bit off. So you, you go places and collect these cards and then there's like a, a blind bidding bit which never sits comfortably with me anyway um, but there's a blind bidding bit to try and get points from the cards but the points you get from those cards are fairly small whereas there's one space on the board where you just go and get loads of points and it's like oh okay so it, it just felt a bit odd mm. um, final game that we played at rune meet when everybody else apart from adam had left uh, we went through ashes so i've recently picked up ashes rise of the phoenix born and we went through all six starter decks, grouping them together in pairs, and we just played through the starter decks. Really, really enjoying Ashes. I don't know whether I ever want to get into the deck building part of this game. I and I know for anybody who's played LCGs or CCGs or anything else, they say that, oh, you've really got to get into deck building because that's when the game comes alive. But I'm getting so much enjoyment just playing the pre-constructed decks from Ashes, and I don't really have time to do deck building. Yeah. So, how, how are you with LCGs and CCGs? Well, I, I mean, I was a huge Magic fan. You know, yeah. I've got, got thousands of cards that were in the loft, but 
No, my eldest son is a magic fan. Oh right, I've okay. Made the way down into into so pass them his on. bedroom. Yeah, um, but uh, it sucked a lot of time and money it does. out of me. And yeah. um, I've steered away from them since, if I'm honest. Well, I, I gave up magic in '99. Yeah, because that's all I did. Yeah. So prior, so '96 to '99, it was magic. I gave up role playing, war gaming, board gaming, everything, and it, it just took over. And then I, I quit in 99, and that's when I made the shift to go into board games, and we know how that's turned out. Yeah, and I, I so. think I was similar, to be honest. I was sort of Ice Age and, and Mirage Cycles, and then... Yeah, that's I started what, with Ice Age. Yeah, and then uh, then I jumped out at the end of sort of Mirage Cycle, really, so it was right. probably those sort of three, four years. See, Magic is one of those games where if you were to buy a starter deck in Magic, yeah, you could play with it, but it's not very good. Whereas a lot of the more modern games, like Ashes, for example... As I say, I, I bought that game, and I, I, I'm I'm probably never going to deck construct. So I only need to buy one copy of the game and played it, and it's really really good, even with just the pre-constructed decks. And I think the Call of Cthulhu LCG as well. Even if you just buy the base set of that, um, there's so much game in there and so much to explore. Even if you just use the pre-constructed that come with the game. So um, I'm I'm happy now that I found a way that I can play these games and still get the enjoyment of them without having to invest any time or money or anything like that in them. We, 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 to be honest, the one, the one we have got, because I played Netrunner when it first came out as well, yeah. and, and my son, we bought the sort of latest version of that. Um, and that, that doesn't need too much investment either, if you can play it as it is. I mean, obviously you can take it on if you want to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. So any other games that you've been playing that you wanted to talk about or... Any that I've mentioned that you wanted to add anything about? I mean, we, we picked up Roll for the Galaxy re- uh, Expo, yeah. and so we've been playing that. Um, I had Race for the Galaxy, but it sort of collapsed under the weight of the expansions and then never got played again. Um, so yeah. it was nice to get that to the table. And it amazed me how, how quick you know you can get through a game of that. It is um, so quick. It is. It's, it's yeah. excellent. Although I, I keep being beaten at it. So unlike you, I, I, I also have a 100% record of that game. <laughs> Oh no, I lost. Oh, yeah, I, I lost. I lost my game after I think winning six in a row, which is odd because I think the game is pretty random, mm-hmm. um, not just with the dice rolls, but with the tile draws and, and everything else. Um, but yeah, for some reason I, I'd won like six in a row. But yeah, I definitely didn't win my game on Sunday. Um, I, I was last by a country mile. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's nice. That's the thing with the game. I don't mind the fact that it's quite random because it's nice to play. It, it, it's elegant, it's smooth, and and it doesn't take much time. No, very uh, so. no, excellent game, really good game. Yeah, so you're fairly new to that one, though, because that's yeah. been out for a while. Yeah, I've probably played it three or four times now, but um, okay. yeah, it's. Uh, um, I think I was I was I was chatting to a publisher um, about another game that hopefully will be coming out, and um, we got onto the conversation of it, and they were recommending it, so uh, I decided that would be the, one of the games I bought at the show. Right, excellent. So something I forgot to talk about in the previous section, and I could edit this in, but I'm not. I'm not going to bother. We might as well just include it here. What's coming up from you in the future? Um, well, there's there's nothing signed as of yet, so I can't go into too much details. Although, like I said, the the uh, micro war game based in yep. Wars of the Roses that's that's um, hopefully going to come out. And then we there was another card game I designed with Ollie, uh, Ollie Oliver Brooks. Yeah. Um, where it's looking quite hopeful. Um, yeah. So already had two games out this year so that's probably it for me I suspect so, so nothing 20. definite no. you have games with publishers that are yeah. just waiting for them to make the decision or sign the dotted line or yeah exactly so ho- hopefully 2017 we'll see another game hopefully yeah I mean I think at this stage now with five published games under your belt that's enough to be sort of noticed yeah you know, you, you, when you're going to new people you go you know here's some games I've designed in the past and ideally they go oh I quite like that game mm-hmm. you know then, it, then you win yeah it certainly um, opens the door it is trying to get over that first hurdle and, and, and getting into the publishers certainly you know I'll have 15-20 meetings at Essen this year um, pitching games again yeah um, and um, hopefully hopefully we'll see some some more in the future well if you've ever got anything which you think could be uh, suitable for CG then then let me know I'll be in touch Paul excellent excellent Right, well, thanks very much for for your time and coming on the show, and um, I'll speak to you soon. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's been great. Cheers.
So that's all I've got time for in the show this week. Thanks again to the sponsors of the show, Games Law, and to Jason Shaw at audionautics.com for the music used in this podcast. Just a reminder, you can still enter the competition from Podcast 38 to win a copy of the networks, and the competition in Podcast 39, this one, is to win a copy of Microfilms. So good luck to those people who enter the competition. Take care, and thanks for listening. (laughs) 